Ah, the 2600. Beloved by older gamers, but often misunderstood by younger gamers. What is it that makes the Atari 2600's appeal endure when games have become so much more complicated? Is it just blind nostalgia, or could it be something more? And what does the Atari have to offer today's gamers? Let's explore Atari's Woodgrain Beast and find out. When many people think of the Atari, they think of its failures such as E.T. or the abysmal port of Pac-Man. Or maybe they think of its simple competitive games like Outlaw or the Pac-In game Combat. But the Atari actually has a lot to offer the modern gamer, especially if you are addicted to games such as the popular Crossy Road. Hmm, that looks familiar. Yes, many addictive and fun mobile games have their roots in Atari and arcade games. And this is not a bad thing because it was an era where they really perfected this one more go feeling. You know, where each time you play the game, you do a little bit better and it ramps up and ramps up and you get a little bit farther. It was partially because they wanted the games to last about three minutes for arcade. So maybe it was initially for that turnover so they can get your quarters, but it also turned out to be a very fun formula. Now, I think what throws people about Atari games is that a lot of them default to a pretty easy setting. So if you're an experienced arcade gamer, uh, it might be a bit too easy for you. Now, when I get a new Atari game, the first thing I do is I check for different difficulty or variations. Uh, you might have to read the manual, and the settings are set with either the game select switch or the difficulty settings. And the difficulty settings are often set per player. So, for example, Berserk is an awesome port of a really cool game, but it defaults to a bit too easy, and by default, it's even missing the enemy evil auto, which comes to get you if you spend too long in a room, so it's completely missing a whole element of the game, and in my opinion, that's a crucial element. Because with that feature enabled, you have to strike a balance between scoring and getting out fast. It's that magic ingredient that makes the game really compelling and fun, and you have to read the manual to figure out what game number it is, because there's no options screen for these games, because the system is so old that there's no way they could have done that. So instead, you select the number of game you want, and that enables and disables different settings. A game like Space Invaders has a massive amount of variations that they programmed into it. This cartridge has all kinds of additions like moving shields, zigzagging enemy shots, there's this invisible invaders mode where the invaders only show up when they're hit, and you have to kind of guess where they are by looking at their shots coming down. There's even a really good two-player simultaneous mode where you share lives, and that makes it a very different experience than if you're playing competitively. And in fact, all these things add up to make this Atari version of Space Invaders my favorite version of the game. And then there's my experience with Yar's Revenge. This game is very popular, and for a long time I had kind of written it off as nostalgia. You know, a lot of people grew up with it, they were drawing, you know, pictures of the characters on their, you know, notebook at school. So I thought maybe it was a game that people had fond memories of, but hadn't really aged all that well, until I discovered game variation number 6, Ultimate Yars, which changes the rule set quite a bit, opens up a lot of new strategies, and suddenly it clicked with me, and this was fairly recently, and it became a lot of fun, and I had trouble putting the game down after I discovered that. A similar thing happened with me and Demon Attack. I had thought I'd seen everything the game had to offer, and then I discovered this hard mode that makes the game much more challenging and more engaging. 
For me, that pushed this game from, yeah, that's kind of cool and nostalgic, into, wow, this is one of the best clones of Phoenix I've seen. The stock Atari controllers are a trip down memory lane, but they're kind of gummy, and they were gummy when they were new. Get yourself some controllers that don't suck, like this Tac 2 by Suncom. They also made this slick stick, which is similar, but has kind of a diamond 8-way gate. I also really like this style controller that you hold in one hand, like this Wyco stick, where it has micro switches. Listen to that. The same is true of the Epic Stick, which is, I believe, the same thing as a Connex Speed Stick in other regions. And of course, you can always use a trusty Sega controller like the Genesis Pad, because it's a standard 9-pin jack. And don't forget to get yourself a decent set of paddles, because some of the most fun games on Atari are paddle games. It's really easy to dismiss paddle games like Pong because they end up being the butt of so many jokes, but uh, there's a reason why paddle games like Pong and Breakout took the world by storm in the 1970s. They're just a lot of fun, especially when that ball really gets going, which I'm not going to show you here because I'm actually playing uh, both paddles myself. But yeah, I think Pong-style games get unfairly overlooked a great deal of the time these days, and that's too bad because with a friend or two, these games are lots of fun, and this Cartridge Video Olympics has some unreal number of variations of Pong. Uh, it's like one of those dedicated Pong machines, but uh, with way more different varieties. It even has this really cool volleyball Pong that's, I think this is one of my favorites on the, on the cartridge. And then we have Warlords, which is a four-player competitive breakout game. And this game is fantastic. I've actually brought this out at parties, and it's resulted in lots of yelling and people leaning in their seats. My friends and I have gotten way into it at times, and I think the reason that people get so involved in it is that, like any good two-player or four-player game, there's kind of a psychological component to it too, where in Warlords, you can catch the ball and uh, really mess with other players. Or, you know, target a specific player or get other players to gang up on a player. Or all kinds of stuff like that. And here we have Super Breakout, which is a, a really good paddle game where, you know, you try to break bricks. It's like Arkanoid, you know, came obviously way before Arkanoid, but if you've ever played that, you know what to expect here. This one has a ton of variations, like this multi-ball one, where if you can get three balls in play at a time, uh, you score the most points, which is uh, much easier said than done. Then we have this Endless Mode, which is really cool. It's kind of like in a Puzzle Bobble, you know, Bust a Move, where you're breaking bricks, but the whole play field keeps coming towards you. So you have to kind of go fast and uh, hit the bricks before they get too close. And I love it in Breakout when you go over the top like this and everything speeds up and your paddle shrinks. I'm playing it on easy, but uh, on hard you have like a, like a very tiny uh, nub to hit the ball with. And I can't forget my favorite, Circus Atari. And all these games require a ton of precision. And the paddle makes that possible because the paddle for games that are on one axis uh, is unrivaled in its accuracy. Even when you compare it to modern analog sticks or even something like a mouse. And the precision and demand on the player to be precise is really what makes these games such a joy to play. And you combine that with games like Scuzzy Side or Kaboom that go so fast eventually that they put the player in almost kind of like a trance state. If you've ever been in the zone playing a game like Geometry Wars or a Manic Shmup, you kind of know what I'm talking about here. The game we're seeing here is called Scuzzy Side, and it's a homebrew from the 2000s. What you try to do is match the colors. When you're over the right color that matches your paddle, you hit the button. And you can't let that color wrap around the screen too much, or it's game over. 
It's very, very simple, but when you're in the zone, you're in the zone. The Atari has been home to a vibrant homebrew scene for a number of years. In fact, it's one of the first consoles I remember having a homebrew scene. I thought it was such a novelty to have new games for a console, not a computer. I mean, the Atari homebrew scene goes back to the 90s with games like This Planet Sucks. Here we're looking at Marble Craze, which is a bit like Super Monkey Ball on your Atari, or, you know, Onyx if you remember that one. Uh, what you do is you roll the ball using two paddles, one for the X, one for the Y, kind of like you're tilting the board. And this game gets very hard very fast. In the earlier levels, you can hit the edges without falling off. In the later stages, good luck. And there are ramps and all kinds of other obstacles. There are different goals for the stages, like getting keys and stuff like that. It's a really neat game, and I think it's one of the first homebrews that really impressed me. Somebody even ported Thrust to the 2600, you know, the Thrust from the Commodore 64. This is almost a 100% port of that game. It's really, really impressive. You're seeing me play very badly an old version of Thrust. Uh, the author has spruced this game up quite a bit since this edition. I think this is like the mid-2000s. But nevertheless, you get the idea. It's Thrust on your Atari. Another port that's kind of neat is called Conquest of Mars, which I believe is a port of a Atari game, you know, Atari 8-bit home computer game called Caverns of Mars. So this is just a small sampling of the dozens of homebrew titles that have been made for the Atari over the last 20 years or so. Like with every other system, fans will recommend you the same 10 games over and over again. And while there aren't necessarily bad games, there are other games to play. Uh, the Atari has a huge library, and yes, there's a lot of crap, but you'll find some real hidden gems in there if you look. This is Fantastic Voyage, a game that I like a lot better than River Raid, which is the game that most people recommend because it has a little bit more to it. You can't let enemies sneak by. There are enemies you shouldn't shoot. Uh, it's got a lot more going on. I also really enjoy this game called Turmoil, which is kind of like a Tempest on the Atari. It's really fast, really frantic, gets hard pretty quickly, and it's a little bit more than just a shoot everything game. There are these prizes that appear, and if you fail to get them in time, they turn into this cannonball that bounces back and forth very, very fast. There are also these arrow enemies, and if you allow them to reach one side of the screen, they turn into a tank that you can only hit from the back. So that's Turmoil, it's very fast, very cool, and I believe there's even a Commodore 64 version. And then we've got Hero, another one of my all-time favorites, and this one is again available on the Commodore as well. And it mixes action and adventure and exploration and even has random level generation. Uh, you know, most people would recommend Pitfall. I like to recommend Hero. And I can't do a whole feature on the Atari without talking about Frostbite, which is just an excellent, excellent game, and you need to play it right now. Uh, you can also watch my full review of Frostbite. If you want a highly unusual game, there's Reactor, a game where you try to fly this ship inside a nuclear reactor or something, what you try to do is get these particles to bump into control rods or to hit the wall and destroy themselves. Your ship can also launch these decoys that draw the particles. And the trick is to use those strategically and you also have to kind of not move around too much. It's a really neat game, very different and a lot of fun and I think well worth the uh, learning curve.
I also really dig Pressure Cooker, a game where you make hamburgers. You've got a list of orders at the bottom, you've got to put the right ingredients on, and where the game becomes fun is when it starts really requiring a lot of multitasking and juggling of different burgers. It's really cool. I also really enjoy Solaris, which is, in my opinion, the best game like Star Raiders on the Atari. You know, Star Raiders is a game where you kind of fly around the galaxy and get in a different combat. You have to protect your uh, space stations. Solaris takes that and adds so many more elements to it. It's not funny. Solaris adds a huge universe to fly around. You've got ground missions, and it really shows what the Atari was capable of when you really push it hard. Another one of the lesser known games I like on the Atari is Towering Inferno. You play a firefighter who has to clear every floor and rescue people, you know, that white square at the top of the screen, and get out in time without being zapped by the fire. It's not perfect, but I really like it, and it's really different, and there's no other firefighting game quite like it. I also really dig Fishing Derby. It's a cleverly designed two-player fishing game. What's uh, not to like about it? People obsess a lot over the really bad arcade ports that you saw on the Atari, like Pac-Man. You know, the original Pac-Man. Um, there are some really fantastic ports, though. For instance, this port of Millipede. If you want a game where all hell is constantly breaking loose, this is a good one. This is really one of the most fun and frantic shooters I've played. So Millipede comes highly recommended for me, and you should go check it out. There's also quite a good port of Defender 2 or Stargate on the Atari that I think rivals the other 8-bit versions at the time, for instance on the Commodore or, you know, Atari 800 or whatever. So if you want to play Defender and you've got your Atari hooked up, why not put in Stargate? Or uh, Defender 2, I think it came out as both names. Another really nice port is Battlezone. You know, they knew on the Atari they weren't going to be able to pull off vector graphics, and so I'm glad they didn't try. Instead, you have this really colorful, very detailed tank game. And it also takes place in real full 3D. So shots are coming at you from all angles. You have to pay attention to the radar. It really takes a lot of spatial awareness and good timing to do well at Battlezone. There's also quite a good port of Gravitar, the game that inspired Thrust. And I think I prefer to Thrust. It's a lot more shooty and a lot more accessible. It also has one of the only home versions of Pac-Man Jr., a scrolling Pac-Man game that will kill you. It is a very, very hard Pac-Man game, and very enjoyable. I like this one. So there you go, that's my overview of the Atari 2600. If you weren't a fan of the Atari yet, I hope that maybe you'll uh, be inspired to revisit it and try some new games out that you haven't tried before, or approach some old games with a fresh perspective. If you are a fan, I hope maybe that you uh, found some new games that you didn't know about that you might dig. And if you enjoyed this program, please, by all means, subscribe to the channel and get updates. I'll catch you next time.